It's that time again. It's time for another Saturday night special where we talk about everything rock hounding related. Before we get into tonight's show, I have a request of you, you the viewer. Well, I learn so much from other people when I get to see how they work. You know, uh, shop tours, set, you know, just the things that people are doing with rocks, uh, the process of lapidary. There's just so much from the tool selection to the layout to the individual shop spaces. I find it fascinating. So I would like to put together a series of videos showing other people's workspaces. Now this could be a lot of things. This could be uh, the corner of a garage. It could be the shop at a rock club. It could be a professional shop, like, uh, you know, that does jewelry and stuff uh, for money. <laughs> uh, if that is you or you know somebody that would be interested in sharing their workspace for a video, uh, please, uh, if you could connect the dots with us, um, you can send me an email, currentlyrockhounding at gmail.com, and... Uh, we can make that happen, especially, especially <laughs> if you live in eastern Washington, central Washington, western Washington, or the northern reaches of Oregon, and maybe a little bit into Idaho, like the west side of Idaho. Uh, that's pretty much where I'm going to be traveling in the coming months. So if that's you, man, please, please reach out, okay? On, on with the show, on with the show. I had a fabulous, fabulous week this past week. Well, you know, I, I'm not, um, I might have some problems when it comes to sleeping. <laughs> and, uh, but I, I make the most of it, right? So it's the wee hours of the morning and I'm staring at uh, the U.S. patent search where you can search patents for, you know, the people who filed. And uh, one came up that I was very, very intrigued by, okay? And that is the hand cabbing apparatus. I'm looking at this, and I'm like, okay, all right. So, like, this thing is it's an expired patent, and uh, if I would manage to actually find this, right? So the other publication, the Sears Catalog, Spring, Summer, 1975, page 253. I don't know why they reference it, but it is kind of cool to see. Um, so... Uh, this is a fascinating tool, and I'm looking at it, I'm like, oh, all right, all right. Like, look, they're, like, making a cabochon, right, by hand, by hand. And looking more into it, I'm like, well, was this ever, did this ever become a thing? And it most certainly did become a thing. And that product, this uh, hand cabbing apparatus, became a product that, I've never seen before, most likely you haven't. It's called the Lore Tone Stroker. And the concept behind this is that you have a block and you could take a preform like of a soft rock, like let's say a preform of uh, calcite, you know, an oval uh, piece of calcite and mount it on a dop. And with this one kit, you could make a cabochon by hand, manually stroking it uh, back and forth and produce the, the, the sewn. Now, the way they had this, um, this is just, of course, a crude example. There's very few good photos of this thing online, but there are some. And the basics of it is you essentially have a channel, right? Like in this case, we're using a piece of aluminum channel uh, for a representation. And you have a piece of corundum mesh sandpaper. So if you had this, and it's held here on the sides, just like that, and now you have this dish. You have a dish. Now you could take your rock, right? Let's see if we can do this, if we can bend that in place. You take your rock, you could slide that back and forth in there, and uh, shape the stone, because the curve of that, uh, I guess you could call it like a <laughs> that hammock curve, will get you that domed shape. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of different grits of these types of uh, corundum and diamond sandpapers. And uh, it came with everything. 
I thought that was fascinating. And it's also since it's a box, it collects the dust. Now, the idea being that it would get you started. Let's say you're like, I want to make something. I want to make jewelry. But you don't want to buy a cab machine, right? You don't have $1,500, $2,000, $4,000 that you can just dig out of your pocket. Uh, so I thought that was really cool. It's a neat idea and something that somebody should totally remake nowadays. There's the, the patent number if you want to go look this stuff up. Um, I mean, I thought it was, it's, it's interesting. It's very cool to see. It's a very simple, simple idea. Um, I like it. I like the idea of having something like that where you can simply start doing lapidary. At the time, they were selling it in 1980, I believe, 1980 for $10, which that would be $36 in today's money. Which I think if that product existed, where it came with multiple grits of corundum mesh paper, uh, maybe like a piece of felt that you could load up with like a cerium oxide, and you can take that preform and make something, man, what a, like even just a, that would be a cool gift, right? Somebody that's into this a little bit, but you're not, they're not a hundred percent. I don't know. Let me, let me know what you think. I mean, I'm not a fan of the, let's be, let's be clear here. I'm not a fan of the name, right? I think uh, the marketing of that product could have been, could have been better, but uh, the concept, the concept of doing something by hand, hand polishing, hand cabochons, no power tools, go take the little kit, sit at the beach, <laughs> make something. I mean, why not, right? Like people sit at the beach and read books. Why not uh, sit at the beach and make a cab? This past week, we uh, put up the video comparing these two things. Um, now, I don't think that silicon carbide is any kind of replacement for your diamond discs. But I do like, I like it, I like it. Okay, so here's the thing. I've done so much work with the high-tech flat lap, and it's a good machine. And if we look at a rock that I polished up on the high-tech flat lap, like, that's a good polish, right? Like. It's a good polish. I don't think anybody's going to argue that that's acceptable. I think it's acceptable. Well, is acceptable the best that you want? Because <laughs> more and more, I lean towards using my Richardson's high-speed sander and my homemade carpet wheel. So if we take something, which I think this is about as good as you're going to get on my setup with the flat lap, the high-tech flat lap, with all the wheels, all the stuff. Um, and, you know, uh, before I show you the other one that we're going to look at here, you know, I don't think you're going to find a video on the Internet earlier, or, yeah, early, <laughs> earlier than mine about the high-tech. I've used it a lot, a whole lot, okay? So here's the one from the flat lap using that process, and here's my, the other one. I think this one on the left is far better. Not just, no, don't care about the rock, right? I think the rock, this one is a better rock, but the polish on this one is far, far better. Far better, right? As we rock across this, when you look at that light rolling, okay, it's better. You can see we have a little bit of orange peeling. Some micro scratching you can just barely detect. <clears throat> now, of course, the downside to the high speed sander is uh, it's a high speed sander and carpet wheels, you can't really buy those things. So you're really relegated to building it. Now, granted, I have plans up and uh, it's not that big of a deal, not that hard, but um, it's not for everybody, uh, both in this type of stuff that you do and just there's a lot of factors at play. But Silicon carbide. Silicon carbide, man, I don't know. It's holding a nice place in my heart. <laughs> I guess it's the affordability of it. I don't know. I mean, 
It, okay, if we go back in time, if we time travel some in the world of a lapidary, uh, almost everybody was using silicon carbide. Silicon carbide hard wheels, silicon carbide uh, belts on expandable drums, silicon carbide discs, because it was affordable. The, uh, you know, things like diamonds uh, are very, very cheap now. Industrial synthetic diamonds are cheap, cheap, cheap. You know, and I, I'm still a fan of this, right? Like, there's no arguing that diamonds are its a better product for a number of reasons. Um, especially if you're doing more, of, well, just a lot, of, a lot of different work, you know, and you're not just, like, doing flat stuff. Um, you know, if you're making cabochons, just shaping, diamonds are going to be better. Um, but <clears throat> the silicon carbide discs, I think, are good for filler, right? Um, to give you an idea, each one of these diamond discs, they're like 80 bucks. They're like 80 bucks. So, you know, you could very easily, right, uh, get one of these backers and use a backer with the silicon carbide disc as a means to uh, get you where you need to go. Like, we, if you use a, a high-tech flat lap, you definitely need a, a 220 disc, which their kit doesn't come with. And while... You could definitely get a uh, lot of 220 silicon carbides and see if you even like that, you know. Something to think about with it. Uh, this past week, I got some fun stuff. Um, my buddy Nicholas, he shot me a message. And he's like, hey, Jared, there's some micro mounts at the local thrift store, Okay. And I'm like, all right, I'll go check them out. I go there, and um, they actually had some very, very lovely specimens of uh, crucite. And oh, we'll, we'll look at the photos of them. Uh, it's interesting. You know, a lot of it, I mean, it's clearly old, probably from the 70s. And one of the ways I'm determining that is, uh, well, our P1 case is, uh, we're a little bit smaller. But these are very cool specimens, but they definitely need to be remounted some are loose you know we have stuff from north idaho here from inside the mines uh, kellogg um we have uh suab from south you know from africa we got some australian very cool to see um what was funny though is they had a whole bunch of uh dyed slabs and it was like the blue ones were twelve dollars and the pink ones were three i don't know if their pricing uh model really uh <laughs> Really holds up, you know. Um, hey, and also, boom, check this out. I got this book in the mail. I don't want to spoil it for anybody because you can still get this book for pretty cheap. I got this book for $3.91. So, can you imagine going rock hounding in Siberia today? Looking for mines, minerals, doing that? I certainly can't. Can you imagine doing it in the 1800s? Well, this is, it's a pretty small book, but it's fascinating. Going on a 9,700-mile journey through Siberia looking for minerals. This is such a cool, cool little book. Like, I'm so happy to have this in my library. You know, um, uh, <clears throat> upon invitation... From the Tsar Nicholas, Alexander von Humboldt, accompanied by Gustav Rose and Christian Enhemberg, Enhemberg? <laughs> conducted a scientific expedition into Siberia's reaches of the Russian Empire in 1829. They left Berlin in April and returned in December after traveling approximately 9,700 miles. Crazy. Crazy. This is a very, very cool book. I'll put the ISBN down below in the description box. Uh, a lot of libraries have it. Highly, highly recommend checking it out. Um, I think uh, it's it's very fun. Very fun. So, uh, I just, I love, man, the adventure. The adventure, you know? Like, I, I would love, as I start to learn, as I start to learn more about the history of mineralogy, rock hounding, all of those things, I'm like, I just, I love it. I love it. Like that have this kind of reference, you know, in here, right. Um, they are, uh, 
visiting visiting a lapidary works um, that's close to a mint in a town. And, uh, you know, they're talking about some of the different rocks that are there that they work um, among the many kinds of massive rocks and minerals worked in the shops, numerous varieties of jasper, adventuring, porphyry, diorite, as well as rhodonite and malachite. And they go on to describe some of this in uh, lots of annotations in this book. Very cool. Um, yeah, yeah. Go find it. Go find it. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, it's, it's great. It's great. I thought... We could do a little bit of a demonstration here. You know, I watch a lot of uh, I watch a lot of YouTube videos, right? You know, about other people rock on videos, and I see a lot of videos of people uh, people cutting, you know, cutting with diamond blades. Oftentimes, cutting hard stuff, right? Hard stuff like you know your jaspers, okay. And well, one thing that I see often is I see people cutting rocks and throwing sparks. Now, I thought we could talk a little bit about the anatomy of what's happening there, right? So, you have a hard rock, and you don't have a very hard blade. Uh, you know, we have all this, uh, depending on the type of blade, right? Like, we have a centering. We have a centering with diamonds, and you can even see them, right? right? There are little spots there in that rim. And uh, the sparks are not the diamonds. The sparks... Or it's the blade. So if you're cutting and you're throwing sparks, you're seeing sparks, uh, you're pushing too hard, you don't have enough water, and uh, you're destroying your blade. Let me show you a little bit of an example of that. So we have this hard piece of jasper here. We have a uh, file. You can see the texture on there. We have a file. And uh, the file is not... Uh, harder than this. So if I hit this, what you'll see is you'll see sparks because the hard rock is shaving metal off of this and uh, well, that energy is combusting. Look at that. You see that? So that's just kind of a basic example of of it. You do uh, kind of need a sharp edge here. Well, you get it. You get it. If you're throwing sparks off of your blades, stop. Evaluate what it is you're doing. Is your blade dull? Is uh, your uh, are you low on oil or water? Are you just pushing too hard and getting impatient? Generally, I think people are getting impatient. So something to factor in. You know, like the process of cutting rocks is a slow process. It's meant to be slow. Trying to zip through stuff like you're cutting a two by four with a chop saw, not gonna happen. It shouldn't happen. That's not the not the idea here, you know. Some of you may have saw on my uh, community tab, I uh, picked up a different machine. Well, I am very happy <clears throat> that I uh, found a Lortone F. L20 vibrating lap. Now, <laughs> uh, the thing's a little big, um, but it's a great, great machine. Let me show you the size of this tray because there's not much out there uh, as a means of reference, okay? Here we go. I'll bring it in from the bottom. <laughs> you can't, it won't, even, it won't even fit in the shot here, right? Like, that's a huge massive massive tray now the way this thing works is it, it vibrates and uh that produces a polish so um you know there's two trays here um and the machine uh it's definitely old but it fully functions perfectly well right now it has on some um rust inhibiting primer and it does have a couple of problems the main problem is that uh, the balls aren't the same. And they're actually so old and squished that it's kind of vibrating into the housing. So I'm gonna replace the balls. And it's very simple operation, right? So you have a motor hanging below the tray and 
it uh, has a counterweight and that causes this thing to vibrate side to side. And that's the basics of it. Um, you put your flat cut rocks down in here with grit and uh, let it grind away. I have two trays um, and the two trays is uh, very nice because you can have a grinding tray and a polishing tray. Now the polishing tray, if you look here, um, there's not a lot of photos of this, but it's basically either felt or an outdoor carpet. And uh, yeah, you just load your finish polish. Um, in this case, they mention, they mention um, using tin oxide as a polish, which I haven't used tin oxide, uh, but you know, uh, cerium, whatever would probably work just fine. Or, you know, I'll look into it some more, but we can kind of see uh, the exploded view uh, in the back here, which is uh, cool. Actually, so you can see the balls and, uh, well, you know, it has like two balls and a bouncy ball right now and they're all mushed. I was actually able to find three replacement balls for this uh, at Kingsley North, like OEM <laughs> old stock, which uh, that's very cool, very cool to see. Um, I do have to get a couple of rings. I, it's gonna be a process. I, I wanna paint it. It's gonna be, it's gonna be cool though. But man, the, the, the scale of the 20 is uh, quite large. And I know some people uh, are probably wondering, like, where the heck am I going to put that thing, you know? Well, uh, where I, right below where I have my drill press, there's a bottom shelf. And this thing would fit perfectly under there, you know? Um, it doesn't need to take up main bench space. Uh, so I could easily have, have that running under there. And if I had something really tall, I could pull it out temporarily for that is what I'm thinking. But in my future, the future of my lapidary is going to be in the cutting and polishing of bigger things, bigger stuff, bigger thunder eggs, bigger slabs, big stuff. And if you're going to have a bigger saw, eventually I'll have a bigger saw someday. I'll need to be able to polish those things. So, you know, uh, the trajectory, uh, <laughs> <laughs> is upwards for uh, the size of the things that I'm uh, cutting and polishing, which that is very, uh, very fun. Um, but yeah, it'll be a good project to kind of restore it. Uh, you know, the motor is great. Everything's great on it. I, I got to paint it. Maybe we'll, uh, I'll throw a poll over there on the community tab and we'll, uh, pick, a, <laughs> we'll pick a color, pick some colors for me. Uh, but yeah, other than uh, the balls and uh, bumper, uh, I need two two new bumpers around it because the the rocks they like vibrate around. So um, should be very cool. The dishes um, are not even that torn up, right? Like so, you can eventually your grinding dish, your grinding dish, um, you will uh, eventually get some cupping. But like I checked it with a. Uh, straight edge and there's no cupping in this thing so very cool very cool very excited always fun to have something new to play with out in the shop well i think we'll leave this one here let me know what you think about um the concept of this uh lore tone hand polisher this uh stroker and uh is that something you would try I think, I think I would want to try it at least once. Um, I do know that at some point they sold it with a kit and it did come with preforms. It's kind of a cool idea. Kind of a cool idea, I think. Well, I think we'll leave this one here, everybody. Uh, go ahead, throw a subscribe and a thumbs up to me if you made it this far. I appreciate it. And uh, I will catch you on the next video.